Okay, so that's the basics of the instrument. Um, any questions, just quickly? Yeah. Just, uh, one there. Going to the fact that they've got no shunts on them, you said they sort of protect it by the way the device is constructed. But I have heard, I, I don't own one of these gadgets, but I have heard a lot of them, we've got to be really careful with the ropes, because if the, uh, the lid's not pop hold of it, you know, they're impossible to really get repaired or replaced. Mm-hmm. Okay, a couple, couple of things. If you get an AVO and you're not sure about it, don't mess with the meter. They don't make them anymore. They're hard to get replacements for. I did read of a guy in Europe who will provide you with a new meter for... How much is 350 euros? It's a bit of money, isn't it? A lot. Thank you, Charlie, for a lot. Okay, so quite seriously. The original... Uh, Characteristic meter, the 2 power 1, 700 microamps full scale deflection. The Mark 1, Mark 2, I think are about 360 or thereabouts. The uh, Mark 3 and 4, 30 microamp movements shunted out to 39 point something. So, firstly, if you're going to um, dig into one, use extreme caution if you're going to measure the meter. If you're uncertain about calibration, my go to is to check the full-scale deflection of the meter movement itself, because if that's not right, nothing you do is going to fix it. But just use care if you do do that. There were later versions, I think there were Mark IVs, that actually had a couple of silicon diodes back to back across the meter. That's a good idea, but a silicon diode doesn't turn on until about 0.6, and the full-scale deflection of the meter is only about 130 millivolts. So it'll limit the amount of overload to about only four times, which the, I, what I've read is, look, a meter will survive a four times overload. You're not going to burn out the coil. You're probably not even going to bend the pointer. But that um, protection is, look, it's good to have, but if it was me, I'd be getting um, Schottky diodes. Uh, the problem with germanium diodes is they start to conduct about 120, 130. So they may actually have a, a shunting effect near full deflection. I believe Schottky diodes are about 0.4 volts, although someone might be able to correct me on that. That would be better. It would only be at about three times overload. So, short answer. The meter is the critical part of the instrument. Later models did have silicon diodes wired across. As well as that, on some of the later models, there was a think, eight microfarad capacitor wired across it on the basis that if you had a very short transient overload, the capacitor would slow the spike down enough that the meter wouldn't be damaged. Problem. And the, uh, the Mark 1 sitting on the table over there, yep. the one's owned by Ray Hosking. Okay. Now there's an article in, uh, I think it was July 1996, in, in Radio Waves, where he describes that as number of the month, because... Uh, <laughs> The ultimate problem there was that it had never been put together properly. It had a, uh, a connection to the wrong bank on a switch, and mm. the one had never been connected. But the meter was a problem to him, and he there's a description in that article of how he got around that with using a, a normal meter and putting other circuit in there, and uh, that seems to work fairly well. Yes, ultimately it's just a moving coil meter. So uh, as long as you can get a meter of, of a suitable replacement, that's it. It won't be, it won't be the genuine AVO, but it will certainly work just as well. Um, there's a guy I've referred to in the notes, Martin Forsberg from Sweden, who's been very, extremely helpful. Um, hi, Martin. Um, he has done about 70 pages of circuit analysis on the AVO. Uh, I may mention this again, but just so that you're clear about this, the original AVO documentation is not legible, as far as I'm concerned. The instructions, mix theory and practice and blah, 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 and I don't know what, and the circuit diagrams in some cases are wrong, and in some other cases are incomplete. So I couldn't find out <coughs> from AVO how the calibration circuit works, because it's not in the actual wiring diagram. So Martin has done a lot of work to correct diagrams. He's actually gone back to an as-built AVO and traced out the entire wiring. And if you've seen inside one, 
Um, that's a pretty impressive, Charlie thinks it's pretty impressive. So, um, be aware that it can be difficult to get exact information. You need to do a lot of research so you can be comfortable if you're going to launch into an AVO, you're actually going to get the result you want and not get, get misled by incorrect or incomplete information. Um, so, on calibration, um, I think I've said that the metre is the fundamental item for calibration. <coughs> Besides the mark 1 and 2, there is no meter calibration in the instrument. That means if the full-scale deflection falls off with ageing, as you must expect a permanent magnet to do, the meter will not indicate correctly. Apart from mark 1 and mark 2, there is no means of correcting that fall-off in sensitivity. Just, just not available, guys. So, if you have one that you find is, is not sufficiently sensitive, you'll need to, to work out what to do about that. The critical thing is that whatever anode current you see indicated on the meter, you put a DC milliameter into the anode current link, and if you've got 100 milliamps indicated, you should see 50 milliamps on your external. DC reading milliameter. It should be exactly half. If it's not, then the meter itself is the problem. Okay. Now, most people go, oh, the set mains is good. So if the set mains is good, that's fine. What you need to understand is that measures the grid voltage circuit inside the uh, instrument, and there is a calibration control for that. That does rely on the meter having correct FSD. If it doesn't, that won't help. Um, yeah, so uh, my check procedure is set it on 400 volts, anode volts, measure between cathode and anode on the pins, I should get 440. 440 because it's this weird thing of we're measuring average, not RMS or peak or whatever. So if I see 400 clicked to, I click to 400, I should see 440 on the meter. That tells me that the main setting is about right. If it isn't, then you'll need to jiggle the main setting and get 440 there. Then have a look at what the set mains indication is giving you. And if that's giving you inside that square on the little red line, then everything's okay. The meter movement itself would be in calibration, I'd expect. But you'd need to follow it all through. Um, so I think that's pretty much it about the thing. Um, any questions? Rob? Um, I was just wondering what a diode circuit used in the 30s. They didn't have semiconductor diodes. Would they use selenium diodes? Yep, it's old stinky. Yeah, selenium diodes. And in fact, the, um, the Mark II that I was fixing for John McIntosh got it all fixed up, working beautifully, turned it off, came in the next day, BAM! The silicon diodes had finally decided they were going to give me some grief. The, sorry, um, selenium diodes had decided they were going to give me some grief. I've replaced them with silicon. Now, there's a whole long thread on the United Kingdom Vintage Radio Restoration and Repair site, UKVRRR. Go see it. There's a lot of argy bargy about whether you can replace the, the selenium diodes with silicon, blah, 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 blah. I think the replacement works well enough that I'm not fussed about it, but you should, if you're going to replace those diodes, I think you should do the background reading and be sure you personally are happy with uh, doing that replacement. I reckon it's okay, but your mileage may vary. Okay. So you've been 60 years of 6 or 5 isn't it? The original, yes, the initial issue did, which is why on, on all the others, you turn it on, you do a set mains, the meter comes over straight away. Oh, sorry, from the direction, it goes over straight away. On the CT160, you turn it on, you go, oh, and it slowly comes up because of the 6AL5s. There's a CT160A, which replaced them with silicon diodes. And again, there's an argument about, well, the, the 6AL5 has a voltage drop of a few volts in forward direction. The silicon diodes are 0.8-ish and there's a whole other thread of discussion about whether that changes things and again I'm pretty sure Martin forsberg has got stuff about that and he does go through a very detailed analysis and said if you want exactly the original results 
doing the diode swap, you should make a small modification to the circuit. I read that and went, uh, yep, I would do that if I was going to remove the 6L5s. Uh, yeah. um, so you're to emulate what the overheat in terms of their testing. Well, there's no really that matches that Okay, I haven't, yes. Um, I know that the, probably everyone knows the Palec or university testers. As I understand, they were emission testers. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, I believe there was a, a Taylor was a transconductance tester. I haven't really dug into that. So I'll, I'll ask your question. Does anyone know of local manufacturers of GM testers? It doesn't sound like it. I, I, I didn't find any, but I wasn't like digging for that. So it doesn't appear as though there were. The emission tester, just so we're clear, um, heats up the filament or cathode and just effectively measures resistance between the filament or cathode and the control group. It's, it's, if you want to find out if valves are any good at all, an emission test is great. Plug it in, wait 10 seconds, nothing, bin. Plug it in, wait 10 seconds, comes up to good, fine. It'll probably work just okay. Um, but if you want to be sure the valve is working at its original specification or you want to match valves for precision instrumentation, then you do need to go to the GM test. The other thing that the emission testers won't do is they don't test at full anode voltage. More importantly, they don't test at full anode current. So the thing with valves is the transconductance is highly dependent on anode current. I mean, it's the reason we use AGC. You put a negative voltage on the grid, the anode current drops, well, you know, the gain goes down because the transconductance responds to the anode current. So if you're looking for valves that are going to be in, in high current applications like um, high, high, high power output valves, you want to be pretty sure that, that when the EL3-4 hits 150 milliamps of plate current, it's still giving the proper transconductance. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that emission testers are useless, they're absolutely the, the go-to because all you have to do is set the heat of voltage, plug the valve in, you don't have to fiddle and mess about. Charlie. What I found with my emission tester is if a valve you set it to 6.3 volt filament volts and it reads 60% or whatever, if you decrease it down down to 5 volts, if the valve's on its way out, it will start to head downwards. And that gives you a good indication that the valve is okay. So if you put a brand new valve in, you can probably go 6 volt it reads 80%, 5 volts it will still read 80%, and the next position on mine is 7.5 volts and it will still read 80%, it won't even increase. Okay, so a good valve doesn't change no, very doesn't much change according to coolant voltage. Yeah. That's the same with big tube testers of old too. Okay. You drop the filament down. Yeah, that's an emission tester. Yeah, it's an emission tester. And uh, if, it, if it stays the same, the tube's going to be good. If it uh, falls rapidly, then the tube's on its way out as well. Okay. When the valve is a bit crooked, you could actually say, oh, it's dropping down. And as soon as you increase the filament voltage, the tube's back up again. It yeah. doesn't need much, and you can see the difference, how it really does make a difference. It does, and um, I'll be, um, in the, I'll just get this point in, in the, um, when I was testing one of them, anyway, um, the filament voltage, the, if you look at the anode circuit voltage, set it for, click it for 400, you'll get 440 measured. If you go to the heater voltage, open circuit, you get about 6.7, 6.9, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not too happy about that. So what I did was I thought, I'm not going to put up with that. I'll change the mains voltage so I get 6.3 on the pins. Works fine. 6SH7 works beautiful. 6AU6, not bad. Um, 6V6, 0.4 of an amp heater current, works fine. Um, then I thought, ah, go for the big boys. Put in an EL34 and the heater voltage came down to 6.9. Sorry, 5.9 volts. What I discovered is with that low voltage, its transconductance had come down from about 12 to 10 milliamps per volt or millisiemens. So I thought, that's not so good, because if I stick with my Mr. Picky 6.3 open circuit, 
every high power valve I put in, like an EL34, is going to really lower its transconductance because they're actually quite sensitive to heater voltage. So I thought, all right, went back and tested, and again, this is in the notes, I found that I could live with the slightly high heater voltage with things like lightweight types like 6AU6, 6SH7 and so forth. It only gave about a 7%, I think 7% error in the final transconductance reading. And I'm probably not as fussed with those um, lightweight signal types as I am with high power output valves. Going with the original settings on the AVO, the EL34 6CA7 pulled it to almost exactly 6.3 and that gave the correct transconductance readings. So, yeah, so valves are sensitive, transconductance is sensitive to, um, to heater voltage. The high power types are more sensitive, so it's probably more critical, first because of the demand that's put on them, and also just to find out if they're any good, that you test at 6.3. And the best way to do it, plug the valve in, set it up, get your mold meter, put it across the pins, and it should be pretty close to 6.3. I remember once my husband gave a lecture on the AVO meter and he actually had two spandable pins on the top where he actually checked the film with voltages. Yep. Because if you check something like those rectifiers, 5AS4s or something, they draw about two and a half amps. Yes. Yep. No more than any other 34 does. Yeah. The, um, the AVO valve data books, the later ones, all had where there were high power valves involved for a heater current, they had in fact. Uh, a, a figure given in parenthesis for the heater voltage. So you'd have 6.3 nominal and then a bracket showing say 6.9 or whatever it was, okay. which is what you set up higher for in the higher... Um, oh, okay, I hadn't, hadn't tracked that down. Yet. Okay.